Kelly Miller High School, located in Clarksburg, West Virginia, was established in this location in 1903 as a school for African American children. The school was named after Kelly Miller, an African American scholar. Kelly Miller High School operated in this location from 1903 until the public school system was integrated in 1956 and its student body was absorbed into other public high schools. Kelly Miller was certified by the North Central Association of High Schools and Colleges and the graduates have excelled in professional, business, managerial, sports, arts, and technical fields. Kelly Miller, the school's namesake, was a prominent African-American mathematician, essayist, sociologist, newspaper columnist, and author. He was born in Warrensboro, South Carolina in 1863, and he became the first African-American to enter John Hopkins University. Later on, he would become a professor at Howard University. Today, there is a Kelly Miller Foundation administered by alumni and provides scholarships to students in need. So first, I would like you to introduce yourself, just give us your name, your age, your job, what you do. My name is Jim Griffin. I'm a lifelong resident of Harrison County. I'm retired from what used to be Union Carbide. I'm 75 years old. I've been very active in the community. I've, uh, at one time I uh, had the distinction of being the youngest branch president of the NAACP. Uh, back when I was 18 years of age, and that was way back in 1965. I've been a lifelong member of the Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church, which is across the street from the Kelly Miller High School where we're at today. I had the privilege of being able to attend this school here uh, for uh, four years, and that was before the integration of schools. Then I left here and went to what was then Towers uh, Grade School. And then I went to Central Junior High and graduated from WI Washington Irving, which was the best high school in the county in 1965. I've, had, I've been blessed to be able to do many things in the community. I have been the uh, chairman of the United Way Board I've chaired the Board of Governors for Fairmont State University. I've chaired the Board of Governors for Pierpont Community uh, College. I've also been the president of the NAACP. I'm the state president uh, of the uh, ELKS, IBPOE of W here in West Virginia. I'm on the uh, board of the uh, Centra uh, here. I'm on the board of the Y. MCA. I also served on the board of the North Central uh, uh, YCF Foundation. So I've uh, been very tried to be remain active in my community. I now reside in Bridgeport. I'm the uh, married to Joyce uh, Louise Elder. Uh, we're the uh, proud parents of one son. Uh, Edward uh, David, most people know him by David Griffin. Uh, he's retired uh, from the military. He now lives in Missouri. Proud parents of four grandchildren and two great-grandchildren. I must say that uh, I'm the proud grandfather of uh, Matthew David uh, Griffin, who uh, graduated from Fairmont State. Uh, who's just received his doctrine from uh, Sam Houston uh, University, uh, and he's the principal of an elementary uh, school in Houston, Texas. That is awesome. What was it like for you growing up around here? I don't think that it was any different here uh, than it was in the rest of the uh, uh, country. Uh, uh, I was raised on this street here, uh, Water Street, which is now E.B. Saunders Way. It was a very knit, uh, a very close uh, neighborhood. You know, everybody knew everybody. Uh, 
went to uh, church at uh, Mount Zion, which uh, I'm a lifelong member. I've been in, a member of that church for over uh, 50 some years. Uh, been a member of that church. Uh, growing up from here, uh, you know, uh, I often say that I'm a product of the 60s, uh, and I've seen the the good, the bad, and the ugly. You know, I uh, was able to see the change that came about in the country. You know, I can remember the days that uh, I was not able to go and sit down in, in the uh, uh, restaurants. Uh, I had to, uh, everything was a carry out for us. We could go in and buy it, but we had to take it out. There used to be a little restaurant on the corner of uh, Water Street here. It was called the Hamburger Market, and it had the best hot dogs in the, in the state. But um, I wasn't able to go in there and sit down and eat them in there. I had to buy them. Uh, I see a lot of people today reminiscing about uh, downtown Clarksburg, about the Dime Store and the Hagen's Ice Cream Place. And they was, those were hangouts for teenagers. Uh, but as an African American, I wasn't able to go and sit down in those places. You know, I could go into the Hagen's, but I had to buy my ice cream and, and go out uh, on the street. Uh, you know, I could not sit down in, in, in Woolworths or, uh, or uh, Murphy's uh, and eat uh, in those restaurants. Uh, there was a, used to be a, uh, a little pizza place that was on the corner of Monticello at the end of the Main Street Bridge there. And, but I could not go in there and, and, and eat pizza. I could order it and go pick it up and take it up. So my life here in, 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 in uh, Clarksburg was about the same as it was uh, in other places in the, in, in the, in the country uh, where I experienced um, uh, what it meant to be African American. I can remember uh, as an a athlete uh, at uh, uh, Washington Irving uh, going to Elkins to, uh, to run track. And uh, we, me and some of my teammates decided to go downtown to a pool room. And uh, we went down to the pool room and I went in and I happened to be the only African American. And uh, I noticed when I went in, and which wasn't uncommon that I got that look, you know, what are you doing in here? And uh, the uh, proprietor of the place told my teammates that uh, I wasn't allowed to play pool in there. So they came over, and, uh, he didn't come and tell me, but my, uh, my teammates came over and told me that uh, the man said that I could not play pool. And I said, well, let's leave. They said, well, we're gonna leave, but we're gonna teach him a lesson. And I said, what do you mean? They said, we're gonna order a Coke and we're gonna throw the Coke through the uh, bottles through the window. I said, no, no, we can't do that. You know, I said, well, here we are in these, athletic uh, uniforms. I said, they know we're athletes. They know we're going to go down to, um, back to the track field. I said, so I talked them out of doing that. But they, I imagine it was their first experience of actually experiencing uh, what it meant, uh, uh, what it meant to me being an African American and not being able to uh, uh, participate in the, the same things that, the, that they did. What is your favorite Kelly Miller memory? Well, you know, uh, my fondest memory was to remember uh, at the time when they, when the football team, the athletic teams was to leave, they would go on trips and they might be gone for two or three days, you know, like if they, if they would go to Charleston, uh, they would take a bus and they would go down and they might play two or three games in the weekend and they might play a game in Charleston and then they might play one in Elk View. And my fond memory is remembering them, them loading up, going to the, to the buses and going to, going to the away games and the band uh, rehearsing. They would, uh, they would practice and march around the, 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 the block, you know, and, uh, and, and, and practice. Uh, 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 and those were fond memories. And, being able to come to some of the basketball games that they used to have here uh, and, and going into the gymnasium, oh boy, you, the enthusiasm in the gym uh, was something else. Uh, and the other fond memory it was that they used to have a little uh, uh, confectionery here where they sold popcorn and, 
and uh, uh, pop. And they used to start popping that popcorn just before lunchtime. And the aroma of that popcorn going through the building. And you know, here it is lunchtime and you're hungry and boy, you couldn't wait to get out of here and go home and, 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 and eat lunch. But the aroma of that popcorn going through the, through the, through the building. And they used to have a hot lunch program here way before uh, uh, there was hot lunch programs. And uh, for a, a nickel, you could go and, of course, now we're talking about 1953, 54, 55, you know, so for a nickel or a dime, uh, you could get a hot lunch uh, here. And the other thing, they used to show movies here. They had an auditorium here that uh, seated 400 students. And, you know, and they had a projection room here, and they used to show movies uh, here, and they had a big movie screen, and uh, they used to show movies here. And for a nickel, uh, you could go see the movies. And I remember seeing Ben Hur uh, here uh, uh, in the auditorium. And of course, my fondest memory is I was in the last play that they had. <laughs> here uh, in the school. I was just in the fourth grade and uh, I had a part uh, in the play and I had, I had a little singing part and it was the beginning of my singing career, but I participated in the last play that they had here. That's awesome, the, uh, that is amazing. Now, if you don't mind me asking, what was your least favorite Kelly Miller memory? My least favorite memory? Uh, I don't know if uh, I can remember my least favorite memory. Uh, let's see. Uh, it must not have been very important because I can't remember a, a, a least favorite memory uh, uh, here. I, I really can't okay, remember. Well, that's, that's amazing. Who was your favorite teacher and why? Well, my, my favorite teacher uh, was, t I had two favorite teachers. One, of course, was my first grade teacher, and uh, she was Mrs. Betty Pleasant. And, of course, uh, uh, I had favoritism. I had favor with her because her and my mother went to, to school together. Okay, so, yeah. so, so, but back there at that, at that time, you know, everybody, you know, uh, uh, went to school with, uh, with the teachers. And the teachers lived in the neighborhood, and you knew the teachers. Of course, my, uh, another one was Mrs. Helen Thomas, and she... Uh, seen something in me that I didn't see in myself, and she took interest in me, and uh, she uh, had me involved in a lot of uh, things, and uh, she uh, had me do my first speaking. Uh, uh, she had me at, uh, uh, it was a uh, church uh, program, and she said, you're gonna learn this, and uh, she, and I was scared to death not to learn it, but, uh, but uh, she was my favorite uh, teacher, Mrs. Uh, Helen Thomas. Do you remember your first day of school? I don't remember my first day of school, uh, but uh, I remember my, my first grade, but I don't remember my first day. What year did you graduate, and what was that year like for you and the other students? Uh, I graduated in 1965. And uh, like most uh, people, when you graduate, you think, oh boy, this is all behind me. But uh, little did I know, uh, the worst was yet to come, you know, that uh, you had to get out and be independent and do things on your own, and, uh, uh, but uh, it was 19, uh, 1965. Was integration in our schools a catalyst for integration everywhere? Not really, you know. Um, integration uh, in our, our schools, uh, it was very limited, really, uh, because uh, uh, integration in the schools uh, really, when, when we went to uh, uh, to integrated schools, we really didn't feel like that we were uh, involved. You know, they we, uh, they didn't really. I knew that I was not going to be. Uh, have a lead in the in the choir. Uh, I knew that uh, 
uh, I was not going to be in, uh, have any of the key roles in any of the, uh, the, the, the programs in, in the school. Uh, even as an athlete, uh, you know, you knew that uh, at that time, a black was not going to be a quarterback of the, of the football team. You know, uh, there was not going to be more than uh, two blacks uh, on, uh, starting on, on the, the basketball team. And so it was still, even though it was integrated, it was still segregated. When the schools were integrated, where did a lot of kids go to hang out or just relax? In the schools? In the schools or outside of schools? You know, it was still, it was still segregated. You know, uh, we went to school, and when we went to school, we came back to our community, you know, and we hung out in our community. There was no mixing of the, uh, of the races, really. Uh, uh, we came back to, to our community uh, and um, did what we, we did in our community. There was no integration. Uh, and it wasn't until many, many years later that they really start in, in integration uh, of, 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 the, uh, of, the, of the schools. Uh, we didn't integrate. Okay. Was there any resistance from the black community? Because, like, we always hear about what it was like for the white community, but never really about how the black community felt. Well, you know, a lot of the uh, blacks did not really want integration uh, at that time. Only thing that they wanted, they wanted to ha have quality education. You know, they wanted to be have the access to the same things that the white schools had. But as far as the integration of schools, you know, they could have did without it. You know, they actually integrated the schools, I guess, in 1956 or something like that. But there was actually a protest by some of the black parents who wanted to keep their students here in Kelly Miller instead of going to the integrated schools. They did not. And I guess that they could foresee what was going to happen to us uh, when we went. You know, we would not be able to participate in the activities that we, you know, where I had a lead role in the play in the fourth grade uh, here at Kelly Miller, there was no chance of me having a lead role in the play in the integration of schools, you know. Uh, so uh, uh, where uh, the choir was all black, you know, when you went to the choir at the integration, you might see two or three uh, blacks uh, in the school. So uh, they wanted to have the opportunity for their children to participate in those things, and they didn't really feel like, and, and as it turned out, they were right. You know, it, it took a long, long time for uh, the students to be able to participate in a lot of, of the extracurricular activities in school. I happened to be in the uh, fifth grade, was in the, uh, the school choir, uh, but I think there was only like two or three uh, uh, African Americans in the choir, you know, and I had a, I could sing, you know, I had a nice voice, you know, so uh, I was uh, 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 one who was in the choir. But uh, they did not, uh, African Americans, many of them, uh, really wanted to keep their own. This is a quality school here. This is a well-built school. Uh, this school had a, a swimming pool in it. We had a, a, a hot lunch program. We had a gymnasium in it. You know, it had an intercom system in it. You know, a lot of those things, when I went to the, uh, to the integrated school, they did not have those things. They did not have those things. So we really gave up a lot when we left this building. This building is still st standing, and it was built in 1919. So it shows the quality of the building uh, uh, that that was here, yeah. you know. So um, uh, there was there was some re resistance, uh, you know. We got hand me downs. The books that we had, uh, we got in this school. We never got new books. Most of the books we got uh, were hand me downs from other schools. When they got through uh, using, they would send the books down to here, and you know we could see where they, uh, they were posted 
property of Lost Creek, a property of West Milford, a property of, uh, of Adamson. That's the type of books that, uh, that we got. And the, the parents felt like, hey, give us the top-notch books, you know, the first grade. We'll be satisfied with, with staying uh, right here. Uh, and we also had quality teachers. Most of our teachers were, were, were master degree teachers. And um, so we were getting a quality education here. It wasn't that uh, uh, we weren't, because we weren't. But you know what? When they integrated schools, many of those teachers were not able to get jobs. They wouldn't give them jobs. The principal, Dr. E.B. Saunders, he ended up being a, a teacher at a uh, uh, Nutterford Elementary School. He had a doctorate. He was a principal. You, th you would have thought that they would have, would have given him a, a, a lateral move, but he was not uh, uh, done that. To be honest with you, this school was probably, at the time, was probably the best uh, facility in the county, you you, you WI, you went to WI, and you know what WI was like. Mm -hmm. I went to WI, and we couldn't even play our our, our our basketball games in the school because we didn't have a gymnasium to to, to host them. They were able to, but because of where this high school was located, where this high school was located, they closed it down rather than bring students down into the neighborhood. So, but we had a, had a quality school here, quality teachers, but they shut it down because of where it was located. Like even now, because um, let's see, it's been four years since I went to WI. I remember my last year, we were walking up the steps and all of a sudden I hear a doom doom and I turn around and there's a girl laying on the floor and I'm like, what just happened? And she says, that pipe just fell and hit me on my head. And I was like, what? And sure enough, I looked down a couple steps below her, and there's a pipe. I'm like, okay, let's take you to the nurse. And I've been coming to this building for a very long time, and I've never had a pipe fall on my head. <laughs> I've never had a pipe fall on my head. Well, and, and the other thing is, uh, they didn't have the Thunderdome when I went to school. You know, they just had those two gyms, and they had the girls' gym and the boys' gym, and that's all that they had. They didn't have no th Thunderdome. And our, uh, our games were played at the uh, National, the Armory, uh, when I was in high school. Uh, WI played their games at the, at, at the Armory. But when Kelly Miller, they had a gymnasium. People could come see the games. And uh, they, like I said, they had a, a swimming pool in here. They had a, a intercom system. They had a hot lunch program, a quality building. It was built in 1919, and it's still standing in good shape. And it was built by a black contractor who built this building. Yeah, this building is awesome. Now, um, just to clarify, what grade were you in whenever school was integrated? I was in the fifth grade. Okay. It obviously wasn't an overnight change, but what was the timeline for change, and how long did it take? I tell you, uh, I went to WI, and we never had a, uh, and I graduated in 1965, and we never had a black cheerleader or a black majorette. During my time, it was after I graduated that uh, uh, I think that Kathy Mayfield was her name, and she probably was three years younger than me. And Kathy happens to be the uh, granddaughter of the, the black principal, who used Mr. E.B. Saunders. And she was, I think, was the first black majorette that we had. And I think that she was probably three to four years. So that was probably 68 or 69 before W.I. had uh, a black majorette or cheerleader uh, up there. So. And they integrated schools in 56 or 57. So that time period, so it was quite a, quite a while before. And really, the 70s 
is when we first start seeing change and we know what occurred in the 70s. You know, uh, the 60s and 70s brought about the greatest amount of change that um, uh, they have. You know, some people like to say, uh, I hear the greatest generation, you know, and they talk about those who fought in World War II and stuff, the greatest generation. I think the 60s were the greatest generation. They brought about the most positive change in this country than, than, than if it's ever brought about. To me, uh, the, we were the greatest generation. We brought about the greatest change uh, in, in, in this country. Yeah, I agree with that 110%. How did the media of the time report on everything going on, and was any of the information or reportings bias? Very little uh, uh, was reported about what was going on here. The reporting here was very, very subtle. And most of the reporting, uh, they got it off of the AP. You know, they would re re uh, uh, repeat what was uh, in on the AP on the national lines. Uh, they never did a whole lot of uh, 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 coverage uh, uh, of what was going on. Uh, they might cover a story. They covered me. Like I say, I was the president of the NAACP at, uh, uh, at 18 years of age, and that was in 1965. And uh, they would come and interview me, but very little was put in the paper, you know, uh, at that time. Coverage was very, very biased. I can't say it was biased because it was very little reporting done. Were you afraid being a minority in a white school once they began to integrate? So I know that you had mentioned that parents were afraid for the schools to integrate, but how did the kids really feel like and interact with it once it happened? In the beginning, very uncomfortable. Uh, I can remember uh, uh, in the fifth grade, uh, there were a lot of racial things being said uh, to us. Uh, our parents kind of cautioned us about that and warned us about it, you know, to try to keep ourselves out of trouble, you know, uh, don't react to everything that is said to you. But it, it was kind of difficult to, uh, at times not to, 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 to do that. Uh, there were some uh, uh, scrimmages uh, uh, that occurred. Uh, I can remember uh, one time um, uh, getting into it to one of the um, uh, city detective's uh, sons. Me and him got into it, and his father chased me home, you know. Uh, 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 but nothing came out of it. Uh, but it was, it was kind of difficult in the, in the beginning. Uh, uh, they kind of... Uh, even in the uh, classrooms, they kind of segregated us in the in the classroom. So, uh, and we kind of stuck together, you know, to, uh, for protection purposes, you know. Uh, but it it was kind of rough in the beginning. So it was like, even though you guys were supposed to be together, you were still very very separated. I felt that we were. Yeah, I I, I think that we were. Uh, at that time, you know, things were a lot different then than they are today. Uh, uh, when you got into junior high, you got an hour for lunch, and you could leave the building. And uh, at that time, uh, you can imagine Clarksburg was was booming. You know, they had a lot of stores. So you, you if you had money, you could go downtown to the bakery or to the uh, restaurant and buy something, you know, but as long as you were back in the school about time that tardy bell rang. You know, you had to be back in the school. But as, as African Americans, you know, the, the, the white students were able to go down and sit in the restaurants and eat. You know, us as black students, we had to go buy our hot dogs and walk out on the street and eat them out on the street, you know. Buy our soda pop and go out on the street and, and, and eat, eat, eat them. So it was, it was very uh, segregated. Uh, so uh, it, it, it was a difficult time, and we were always on guard uh, because we felt like that somebody was going to accuse us of something or somebody was going to approach us of something. Or, you know, it, 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 it was a difficult time. Now, what age were you whenever you stopped being on guard all the time, if you stopped? Because I know some people did it. I'm 75, and I'm still on guard. You know, yeah. uh, I, I think that uh, you, you still feel as if that uh, 
there's still places in, uh, that uh, I don't feel comfortable going yeah. at 75. You know, uh, oftentimes I tell people uh, in West Virginia, uh, once you get off the interstate, you better be careful. You know, that when you go back in some of these uh, uh, little hollers and names, uh, uh, you better be careful. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it, it's, it's like, even though we've come so far, we really haven't, if you look at it from like a bigger picture. Because um, like, even like me with just driving with my dad, there have been times we've gotten pulled over and they have no reason other than he fit the description. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it seems like oftentimes, you know, sometimes they say, you know, why do you keep on telling these stories and stuff, you know? You know, and the Bible tells you, you know, tell the story so it doesn't repeat itself, you know. History does repeat itself. Now, I told you about the story about me going uh, to Elkins and what happened to me. My son played at, uh, baseball at Bridgeport he went to, he was playing baseball, and an incident happened to him in Elkins. And they had to stop the game in Elkins because uh, they were out there, some kids were calling him the, the N-word and, and everything, they had to stop the game. So history does repeat itself, yeah. you know. And, and it happened to me in, in the 60s, and it happened to my son in the 80s in Elkins. Yeah. What type of response did you receive versus what you wanted and hoped to have received whenever the schools finally did integrate? I don't know if, uh, if uh, what I anticipated, what I expected to hear from the, uh, the response from them. Uh, we were, our parents prepared us for what we were going to encounter, you know, and they, they told us, you know, this is going to happen, you know, they're not going to accept you, you know, you got to be careful, you know, watch your mouth, uh, uh, don't do this, uh, don't do that. So we kind of uh, were prepared for that. We were always on guard. Yeah. We were always on guard. And so I didn't know what to expect from the teachers. I just knew that my, uh, my, my mother had told me that, uh, hey, it's going to be different. And... Uh, they go want you to stay in your place. That was what the uh, 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 that your parents used to tell you at the time. You know, they gonna want to keep you in your place, and your your place was what they decided. thought decided. Um. So, were there different rules for you guys compared to the white kids in the schools? I think that there was. Uh, you know, uh, I, I think that anything there was two sets of rules. There was a white rule and the black rule, and we knew that, and we knew that, and we reacted uh, uh, accordingly. You know, uh, I'd see uh, white students get by with things that I knew that I didn't even try to do some of the, those things. You know, I, little things, uh, being able to participate in things. It's hard to imagine, but when I was in the in the, went to Towers in grade school in the fifth and sixth grade. Uh, they used to have what they called recess where all the students would go to the restroom at the same time. And after recess, they would have, uh, uh, you could buy uh, milk, uh, they would, but if you had the money to buy it. But they would, the teachers would take uh, a, a role of who, all right, who wants to get milk after recess? And they would turn that list into the, to the principal's office. Well, they would pick students to go and deliver the, uh, the cartons outside the classroom. You know, so if, if the fifth grade class was getting 20 bottles today, uh, when the uh, delivery truck come, you would go to the delivery truck uh, count out 20 bottles and you would sit it outside their door. Well, one of the rewards for doing that, that you would get yours free. So, there's very few times that an African American was chosen to do that. And there's very few times that we had a nickel to even buy uh, uh, that. So, 
you, you always would raise your hand, you know, wanted to be chosen, but you knew that your chances were very, very slim of being chosen to, to get those uh, special privileges. What do you think myself and others should know about your experience and others that we currently have nothing on? I think that uh, they should know that uh, never to quit. Always be determined to reach your goals. Uh, that uh, if you keep on trying, you can succeed. It was difficult at those times uh, going to, to school. Uh, I remember uh, with Facebook, you see a lot of things, and people ask a lot of things, do a lot of memories, and people put things on book. And I remember um, someone posted uh, a picture of, there used to be a, a G.C. Murphy's, it was a dime store, and it, used to, it had a little, uh, uh, place where you go in there and sit down and buy uh, soda pop and ice cream and stuff. And they posted on there, what is your fond memories of going to G.C. Murphy's? And I wrote on, I have no fond memories because I wasn't allowed to go into G.C. Murphy's. And they say, what? You know. So, need to remember those things. And, 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 and we want the, uh, uh, the, this generation to know what we went through for them to be able to enjoy the things that they have today. I happen to be the first African American to be a cashier at what was called A&P. A&P in our day was the Kroger's of today. There used to be a, a, a grocery store called A&P. It was Atlantic and Pacific, and they were just like Kroger's. They were all over the place. And there used to be one on the corner of Monticello and Main Street where they tore, where the par empty parking lot where they um, tore down that building, yeah. you know, to made the parking lot. There used to be an A&P there. And I went to work there as a, a clerk. And um, they, uh, I used to, at that time, you didn't, everyone, they packed your bags, your groceries in the bag and the paper bags, and I worked, uh, and, and you would go out, and uh, if they need assistance taking their groceries out to their car, you'd take it out to the car. Well, one Saturday, I was packing bags uh, for, for the clerk there, and she said, it's time for you to uh, learn how to run the cash register. I said, no, no, I didn't want to learn. She said, no, you're going to learn. Well, the reason why I didn't want to learn because I felt like if I was, I was going to lose my job if the general manager came out there and see me running the, the cash register. She said, you get up here. So I got up there and started running the cash register. And when the, the manager came out there and he seen me, he said, what's he doing up here? She said, everybody else is a, learns in here knows how to run the cash register. She said, it's time for him to learn how to cash register. So I started running that cash register. And... Boy, oh boy, one lady came up to, the, for, to be checked out, and she told the lady that was training me, I want you to check me out. I don't want him to check me out. And she told her, she said, if you don't want him to check them out, you take them groceries and put them back on the shelf. And I said, no, no, that's not. She said, no. She said, there's no reason for you not to be able to check Check him out. And I can remember my mother coming, standing just in the store just to watch me run the cash register because she didn't figure she'd ever see something like that in her lifetime just to run a cash register. But that was something they wouldn't allow us to do. You know, we could be janitors in the store, you know, uh, uh, other things, but they wouldn't allow us to, to run the cash register. And so we want this generation to know what we went through, just to allow them, you know, 
to be able to run a cash register, you know. And uh, uh, she would just stand there and just, just watch me and just smile to see her son to be able to run a, a cash register. You know, people say, oh, that's just, that ain't nothing big today. But back then, for an African-American to go in a store and not be a janitor or sweeping the floor or carrying packages, to have a, a, a position of responsibility to, of running the cash register, it was a big deal. Yeah. It was a big deal. That's amazing. Thank you for sharing that. Are you satisfied with the changes that have been made in the world and schools from then to now, or do you think that there needs to be more change? I am very disappointed at where we're at today. I thought that what we went through in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s, to see what was going on in our country today, I wouldn't believe it. The, would I have ever believed that there would have been a January the 6th? You couldn't have told me that. You couldn't have told me that. Would I believe the, uh, to see the hatred that we see in our society, in our country today? It, to me, it's about as worse today as it was in the 60s. And I'm very disappointed at where we're at as a, as a country. Not everybody, but people today, they're not willing to take a stand and say, this is wrong. They let those in the minority who want to do ill to do it and not stand up and say, hey, this can't happen. In the 60s and 70s, we had good people who came along and said, hey, this is wrong. We've got to make some changes. You know, and I don't see that in our society. I don't see it in our churches. I'm very disappointed in, 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 uh, in, in our churches today. Uh, when I came along uh, here in Harrison County, uh, churches would, would stand up for what was right. Uh, if there were issues, housing issues or, or, or whatever it might be, uh, they, they, they would stand up. But I don't see that today. Uh, so I, I'm, very, I'm very concerned uh, at, at the climate of the country uh, uh, today. Uh, yes, there are good people in this country. And people say, well, that's not the country. Well, why is it happening? You know, to see some of the things that occur. Uh, did I ever think that I would hear about a six-year-old shooting a teacher? A six-year-old? Uh, would I ever think that uh, 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 the many things that are occurring in our society today? So I'm a little concerned about where we're at today, and hopefully that we can get this thing turned around. What, um, what, if you could change anything and make changes to what's happening, what would you do? How do you change people's hearts? You know, and, and that's where I think that we need to, we're, we've become a, a, a moralist uh, country. You know, where's our morals anymore? You know, and, and that all starts within the, uh, your heart. How do you change people's hearts? And, and if I could go about and change people's hearts, uh, that's what I would change. And how do you go about doing that? I don't know. Only God can do that. To, you know. Do you feel your education, whether book-wise or world-wise, suffered or flourished after integration? I don't think that it suffered. Uh, uh, I think that uh, education in West Virginia, period, 
you know, uh, uh, I think we have to uh, feel like that uh, we can improve on it. But I don't think that it, uh, I suffered any more than anybody else as, as, as far as, as the education. Um, so we know that you felt stand like kind of like, yeah, when the school started to integrate, um, did that ever change? From the fifth grade to the 12th grade, did I see a change? Mm, I don't think that I did. Uh, I think that I've seen more change in the last uh, ten years than I did uh, when I was going to school myself. I don't think that there was a lot of change. Okay. Um, so, do you feel that our history books and history books in the school? portray the history correctly? No. no. Okay. Well, if it did, you know, they, they keep on talking about, you know, some people are complaining about black history and Black History Month. You know, if they taught American history, which is inclusive of the contributions of, of black Americans, we wouldn't have to have Black History Month. But uh, uh, I, I think that they, uh, we still, they, I feel sometimes embarrass myself about African-American history that I don't know. Yeah. And, you know, and still there's a lot that has not been told. Um, I lost my train of thought. Do you feel like if we brought in more historians and more people with experiences like yours into our schools and did more documents, uh, documentaries on them, and do you think it would help at all? I think we got to tell the story. Yeah, I think it needs to be told. Uh, I, I think one of the things that w w we need to uh, do is that we need to, for African American students to see more teachers to look like them. Uh, and uh, we in West Virginia have done a very, very poor job in trying to d d diversify our faculty and staff. I think, you know. Yes, we have some some good white teachers, but they still cannot experience what a black student goes through. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so I, I think that they they really needed to diversify the, their their uh, uh, their staff and their teachers. So I know you said diversify and do more. Uh, things with speakers and people that went through these times. But what else could not only our state, but the country do to get the history correct? I don't know if we can do more than, than, than to tell it. One of the problems that we have is, is, is the story is not being told. Uh, and I think that we need to tell it. Uh, the other thing that we need to uh, we need to train uh, we need to do some diversity training with our with our teachers and our faculty. Uh, I think it, the story needs to be told, and I think we need to take every opportunity that we have to tell the story. And I think it needs to be be told by African Americans. We need to tell our story. They need to bring people in. Tell our story. Why do you think they aren't telling her story? They don't feel like it's important. Uh, they don't feel like it's uh, uh, it, it 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 needs to be told. And uh, and in West Virginia, uh, because we're such a small uh, percentage, they don't think it's important for for it to be told. Well. Hopefully within the next year or so, which that's probably not gonna happen, but hopefully soon we begin to see a change. Do you think do you think if we got more clubs, like diversity clubs, more we took more trips to places like DC and places that have the cultural museums, 
do you think that would genuinely help or do you think it would help for a little bit and then nothing? It starts at the top. If you don't have people committed at the top, it's not going to happen. If you don't have uh, your uh, uh, educational system at the top, your superintendents, your principals, uh, your, 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 uh, um, your people in Charleston, it starts at the top and it filters down. If they don't take an interest and they don't feel like it's important, it's not going to happen. Uh, so it, it starts at the top. Now, what do you hope to see happen to the community within like the next five to ten years? That I'm still around to see it. <laughs> 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 you know, I, I'd like to see it continue to grow. Uh, I'd like to see uh, young people uh, feeling comfortable uh, in, uh, in the environment that they're in. Uh, I'd like to see uh, the, uh, the community center continue to grow. Uh, I'd like to see uh, uh, the, um, the, the diversity that we talked about that the, uh, with teachers, uh, training. Uh, I'd like to see uh, uh, students uh, come back to the community and, and, and contribute to the community. Uh, my grandson, uh, he graduated from Liberty, uh, graduated from Fairmont State, uh, grad got his doctor. He's in Texas. You know, that we, that we make an atmosphere where welcoming that people, young people will want to stay here in West Virginia and make the best that we can here. Yeah. I lost my train of thought again. I had a really good question. I do have a question. Yeah. So, Mr. Griffin, I have a comment as a human and a, and, a, and a question as a teacher. And as a human, just thank you so much. Like, your story has definitely touched me just listening to it. Um, and if I may, presume a little bit. I think that you definitely made your mother proud. Um, and I, I really appreciate you sharing your heart with us on that. That is very meaningful. Um, as a teacher, <laughs> uh, so I, I teach history and government, civics, all the things we're sitting around here talking about. And uh, I also get to chair the faculty this year at Robert C. Byrd, which is the current iteration of the school you went to. And so, uh, on behalf of the faculty, uh, thank you. And what advice would you give us in addition to what you've already said, or what do you think we need to hear? You know, I, I think that you need to be leaders. You know the environment that you're in. And oftentimes, uh, because of that, People don't want to step forward and say, hey, we need to do something a little different. It, it, it's a bold step that you have to take, but if you don't take it, it's never going to happen. Um, can you imagine how those young children felt that were in those marches in the 60s and knowing what might happen to them simply for marching for their rights, but they were brave enough to go ahead and march. I think that there are a lot of teachers who see things that they feel like that are wrong, but they're not bold enough to take a stand and say, hey, we need to take a look at this. Are we really doing the right thing here? And somehow, somebody's got to step up and say, this is not right. And, and I know you're going to have to be very diplomatic because your job is on the line when you do that. But somehow, you've got to work through those things that you know 
that are wrong racially and do something about it. And it might start in your classroom by venturing into territory that you know and teaching things that you know that should be taught that are not being taught. And, and or suggesting, hey, why don't we try this, you know, and it might be along racial lines. Uh, doing Black History Month, or not, don't just limit it to February, because that's the only time that the, the, the black students feel like that they're gonna get any recognition is in February. You know, do it all year. You know, uh, when you see the opportunity to give uh, uh, students of color a chance, but it's a bold, you know, I look back at some of the teachers that I, I had two black uh, teachers when I was at WI, I only had two. Uh, one was a math teacher and one was an English teacher. And uh, they were tough. But they can't, well, when things were going wrong, I could go to them, you know, and say, hey, hey, Mr. Jones, what about this? What about that? And I, he might not have told me what he'd done, but I know behind, he went and probably addressed the issues that I might have had with that teacher or, 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 or something. And that's why, it, it, and for, uh, I don't know if the, teach, uh, if the students today in the schools feel like there's a teacher that they feel comfortable if they have those type of issues they can go to and, and talk to. So how, how do we go about changing that? I, you know, I'm, I've been dealing with some issues that in, in the school system and at RCB and WI and some of the other schools. And, and sometimes I think the teachers, some of the teachers really don't feel like they've done anything wrong. You know, they're, they're doing, you know, are, are, are surprised that the, that, the, that the students feel that way, you know. So that's where I think the training come in. We really need to do some, some the diversity training. And I tell you, with the climate of, of the country today, uh, they feel like they can do these things and get by with them and nothing's going to be said about them. But it's a, you're going to have to, it's a, it, it's going to be, you're going to have to be bold. And, uh, and I know that you say, well, hey, I got a family to feed, you know, I'm not going to put my job on the line, but you got to, it's, 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 it's a bold thing. I remember what it was. Um, what kept you going and kept you motivated during those times and also through all of the other amazing things that you have done in our community? I guess that I, I seen what was going on uh, across the country to motivate me. You know, I, you know, I didn't have fire hoses turned on me here, but I could watch TV and see fire hoses being turned on kids. I, I, you know, I seen what Martin Luther King was doing, you know, and I, I seen, I remember John Lewis uh, being beaten, you know, and I said, those people are fighting for me to have the same things here in Clarksburg and I'm not having to go through those. So it kind of motivated me to say, hey, I'm going to do my part. I'm going to do my part locally. And I just felt like that I, if I did my part, I was gonna make a, a, a better place, uh, a better world f for everyone. And you know what? I, I mentioned the things that I have done in the community on the Board of Governors of Fairmont State and uh, United Way and Board of Governors of, of Pierpont. I was the first African-American um, manager at Union Carbide. In 1972, I was the first African American uh, uh, supervisor that they had there. But you know, in all the things that I participated in, the United Way, Pierpont, and, and the things that I felt like that I accomplished, 
You know who benefited uh, from that? More so. With the population being 3% African American, 97% white, 97% of the white kids uh, benefited from the things that I did in our community as the African Americans. You know, when I uh, sit on that board of governors and made decisions for the school, I didn't do it just for African Americans. Mm -hmm. I did it for everybody. When I was on the United Way board, you know, I didn't do it, do it didn't make decisions just for uh, African Americans. I did it for, for everybody. So I felt like that all the things that I did in my community, I did for the betterment for everybody in the community. And hopefully that it helped the African Americans also. Now this is my last question for you. We often hear that my generation and generations below are the generation of change. Do you agree with that? And what can we as students do to make a change? You're definitely the generation of change, but I don't know if it's a positive change. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I, I often felt like that uh, your generation and the two generations behind you, uh, they were given too much. They were given everything on a silver platter. They didn't have to work for it. Uh, I think that uh, the mere fact that I appreciated more what I obtained because I had to work for it. And I think that one of the best things that I heard that uh, they started in schools were, were seniors had to go out and volunteer a certain number of hours. I think they ought to be, I think that's a good thing. Yeah. And I think that the, your generation, they need to, to keep in touch with the generations before and know what they went through. And they need to, to get involved. Uh, it's just amazing how they've uh, de detached themselves from their community. They've got their own little world and they really don't want to volunteer. They don't want to uh, bring about change. They're just reluctant to, oh well, that's the way it is. My generation, no, if that's the way it is, I don't like it and I think it ought to change. But your generation will just accept it. Well, that's the way it is. You, you know, uh, I was talking to a, a young man one day and he said, um, I'm going to quit my job. I said, why are you going to Because they don't want me there. That's a reason for you to quit your job? I said, when I went on to a job and I knew that they didn't want me there, I worked that much harder to stay there because I knew they didn't want me there. But they, they'll just quit. You know, they're just, uh, so I, I, I say to your generation to, to get involved uh, with, with society and what's going on. I tell my grandchildren, uh, and when they see grandpa coming to the house, they know that he's gonna say it to them. I tell them they need to watch a half hour of national news every day to know what's going on in the world. As soon as I come in the door, they said, all right, Papa, we know, they probably don't watch it no other time than when I'm there, but you need to know what's going on in the world. Yeah. And I, I, sometimes I think you're de de detached from the world. You know, everything is not going on on TikTok or, or on those uh, video games. <laughs> you know, you need to take time to know what, in my generation, we, we, we were. We were involved on what, what was going on in the world. And I think that some, you need to, to know what's going on in the world. And uh, watch a half hour of national news, not, not uh, Fox News. <laughs> Uh, everything but anything but Fox News. Anything but Fox News. Anything okay, but Fox it. News. Got it. <laughs> well, I thank you so, so much for coming and speaking to me today. Is there anything else you want to add? No, I appreciate it. Thank you for the opportunity, and I'd gladly do it anytime. Thank you so much. You're welcome.
that was so fun. Mm.